Lord, humble myself in your sight. And Lord, we depend on you. I depend on you. Depend on the Holy Spirit now to be present, to speak through me. Let it not be my words, Lord. Let it not be my experiences and my understanding, but let it be from the Lord. I pray, God, that you'd speak through me, to me, and through me to these. Give ears to hear to all of us, Lord. What does your word say? Help us interpret it correctly, Lord. Help us hear it and believe it. Help us not be like the children of Israel and how they went through the wilderness and, and they just couldn't believe unless things were going perfectly. Help us not grumble, Lord. Lord, I just pray for the blessing of Almighty God to fall upon this, this time and this next hour. Be with us, Lord. I depend on you. They depend on you. We need you. And we um, just ask for your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are continuing the series and types and shadows in the Old Testament of Christ. And I've loved this series um, because it points us to our Savior. Uh, so many people that I hear of think you just do away with the Old Testament because we don't need it anymore. And I just don't see that. I don't see that from the writers of the New Testament who quoted constantly from the Old Testament. Where did Paul go after he got saved, got his revelation of Christ? He went into the desert of Arabia for three years with nothing but the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, the Pentateuch, the Psalms, and the prophets. And he it says he got a revelation of Christ. Christ is in the Old Testament. We heard a message from Jason on prophecies of the Old Testament and all the myriads of, I think there's over 300 um, prophecies of Jesus in the Old Testament, of his coming, of his life, death, his suffering on the cross. All these things are mentioned in the Old Testament. But there's also so many things that we don't even see unless they're pointed out to us, of types of Christ that are in the Old Testament. We've seen that throughout when we were studying all last year with the men um, and women of the Old Testament that were types of Christ. And I loved that series. And so I hope I can bring that out to us today and that we would search here Search the scriptures here and see where we can see Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So I'm going to start by um, bringing up the, the two men on the road to Emmaus. This was th uh, three days after the death of Christ, and they were hopeless. They were walking along from Jerusalem to Emmaus, which is a seven-mile journey. That must have taken them three hours, and Jesus appears to them. They don't know it's him. It says their eyes were withholding that they did not know it was him. I think maybe he was in a different form. I mean, if they knew him, so if they saw him, they would know him. Um, it's kind of hard to not understand that. So they, he had to have been somehow in a different form. But it was Christ. The scripture says it was Christ. And Jesus begins to ask them, why are you so downcast and, and why are you um, grieving? And they were astonished and said, are you the only one who has not been in Jerusalem three days ago? And there was a man that we believed was the Messiah and he was killed. And then at that point, Jesus uh, steps in with these words in Luke 24, verses 25 to 27. He says, And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses. Um, so there we see right there, he's the Old Testament, the Pentateuch is where Christ is. So he sees it. As beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So many of the verses we're going to go through here, I bet he was bringing them up. 
to these men. So let's listen to what, what we're going to be um, hearing. And I'm going to give you one more. In John 5, 39, Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees. And he was rebuking them in, in, in some ways. But they were constantly seeing him in a negative light. He was from the devil and so on. But here's what Jesus said to them. He said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. And yet it is they that bear witness about me. So it's not just the prophecies that we want to look at today. Those lead us to have faith in who Jesus is. But let's look deeper into these meanings of things that were types and shadows that were fulfilled in Christ. And we've been doing that all along the way, and I want to attempt to do that today. I have two goals from this message. And one is just to learn about the wilderness itself. Uh, what is the purpose of the wilderness? What was the purpose for the Israelites in the wilderness? Why did God have them go through the wilderness? And then let's apply it to us. Why do we go through the wilderness at times? And then the second goal is going to be to find Christ's shadows in uh, the wilderness scriptures. So um, let's start with what is the wilderness. I'm going to ask you a question. What comes into your mind when you hear the word wilderness? Think about it for a second. I was brought up in Colorado, like many of you. Um, and so to me, when I think of the wilderness, I think of when I was a teenager or in my young 20s going backpacking, getting a backpack and a tent and some food and just going parking way up in the mountains and then hiking in another seven miles where nobody's at. Pristine wilderness, um, mountain peaks, um, and just beauty. To me, the wilderness, when I think of the word wilderness, I think of beauty. I think of, this is fun. I want to go do this. Not something that's tragic and, and suffering like the children of Israel. So, so let's keep that in mind. The wild, word wilderness, and that, that actually can be suffering up there too. I've gone up there and um, got hypothermia before because it rained so hard on me on the way up and we couldn't get under. We tried to get underneath some trees, but it just kept coming down. That was in like 2011 or 12. And I got, when we finally got to the top, I was shaking. I had to get in my tent and they had to put a bunch of blankets on me and stuff like that. And everybody was pouring it on me because I couldn't get warm and I was freezing. And it wasn't that bad. I was probably 60 degrees, but I had frozen. Um, during the trip coming up. And I was actually in pretty good shape back then too, but that's what the wilderness can do. The wilderness is daunting at times. There's wild animals even up in, the, in our mountains, you know, and things like that. So there's dangers. There's um, snow, you get frostbite, things like that. Um, but that's, that's uh, Colorado. But the wilderness is different depending on what region we are. There's, all, there's similarities in all of them, but um, the Judean wilderness is not so beautiful. I don't know if you've seen movies with um, people, you know, going into the back country, but it doesn't look fun to me. It's dusty. I don't see any green grass, not even weeds at times. It's just rocks and dust. Um, and that's kind of what the Judean wilderness is like. I'm sure there's some places there. I mean, they did run into the place of 70 palm trees at one time, and there was, there's some water, but there's not a lot of water back there, so there's not a lot to make it green. And this is where the children of Israel were going through. It's the land between Egypt and the Promised Land. And that's what they had to go through. They, they were brought out of bondage, going to the Promised Land, and in between lies a gigantic trial ahead of them that God has put there for a purpose. So I'm going to give you a general dictionary definition of what the, world, what the word wilderness means. It says it's uncultivated, uninhabited, inhospitable region, vast and rugged, a forest or desert, inhabited only by wild animals, a tract of wasteland, a desolation. That's the, that's the uh, definition from the dictionary, but I'm going to give you a, a biblical definition which actually makes it a little bit stronger than that to me. It's found in Jeremiah uh, chap chapter 2, verse 5. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did our, your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? 
They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt, who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through, where no man dwells. That's a pretty bleak description of the desert, but I just want you guys to get that picture. This is where they were. This is the kind of land they had to, tra- uh, to go through. And then lastly, I want to take a look at one more aspect of the word wilderness, and that would be a wilderness experience. A wilderness experience, maybe you already can picture what that is, but it, it is it's more of a symbolic kind of a word at that point. You take this description, a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought and so on, uh, a rugged place, and then think about experiences you've been through, and that describes it for me, and a lot of them, and I'm sure many of you, I know many of you that it has describes that, uh, that very thing, and it's, we're all going to go through these types of experiences, whether it's physical or whether it is a spiritual experience, but uh, one way or the other, we need to, to get through, so I'm going to hope I can course bring the course to us that we can walk through this. So I want to keep asking the, the question, what is the purpose that God has for letting you go through a wilderness period? What is the purpose? Because there is a purpose. Nothing is wasted with God. He is the sovereign one. If you're going through a wilderness period or have gone through one recently, please don't charge God wrongly. Please don't do that. Even though it's tempting to wonder where is God, I've done it. I've done it. Years past, I went through wilderness experiences wondering, where is my God? I think he's left me. I really went through some strong periods like that. But we need to learn to trust in the Lord in the bad times as well as the good. Because they're coming. One way or the other, they are coming. But um, I want to mention one more quote here from a guy named John Bunyan. Um, lived 300, I, I think I mention him every time I preach, but um, he was my favorite author. He authored The Pilgrim's Progress, but in his book of Grace Abounding of the Chief of Sinners, he went through a wilderness experience for about five years. Intense. If you read his book and you've been through this kind of experience, it's hard to read. It's, I felt like I wrote some of those pages because of the experience was very similar. But he had believed that God, he couldn't be saved. And he wasn't doing anything that he could say, absolutely, this is where it is. I, I got to forsake this, but I'm not going to. And, and then point to that and say, that's why. It wasn't that. It was just, it was in un, he was in the land of unbelief. And he was going through the fire. And sometimes God will let us go through the fire for a season to bring out gold in the end. Like he says in James, a trial of our faith is more precious than gold that perishes. The gold perishes, but our faith is the only thing that matters when you're in the middle of that kind of trial. But John Bunyan said, I was like a man that lost a gold ring, a very valuable gold ring that I could not not have. And he said, it was like um, in the fall, and I lose it in my backyard when all the leaves are all over the grass, and I know it's out there somewhere. And he said, I was out there looking through the scriptures for a promise that I could hold on to, taking it like a leaf back there and just look, is it there? Is it under that that leaf? Is it under that one? Trying to find a promise that he could cling to that would get him through his struggle. And, um, And then when he would find it, it was like, have you ever seen a movie where somebody's been through the desert um, I watched this movie, The Way Back. I don't know if you guys ever saw that. The guys that left uh, Siberia somewhere, they had to cross through cold first, but then they had to go through the desert to escape their, their persecution that they had. And um, they went through this long, dry time. And one of the l- girls died there because it was so intense. But their blisters all over their mouth and sunburned and... Their eyes are bloodshot from the sun, and, and just um, when they finally found water, they dove in. They couldn't get enough. They about drowned, you know, trying to drink it because it was so precious to them. That's what it's like when you lose your faith or when you go through a struggle like that, but then all of a sudden the light bulb comes on 
and you know that it wasn't true. I believed a lie. And here is the truth. It becomes like that, that man. You just, all you want is that. And all you want is Christ. You fall in love with him. This is what has happened. And this is sometimes the experience that God brings us through to get us to a place to, um, to be able to, to be in love with Christ and he, he is our all in all. The wilderness experiences are for testing. I can tell you that from Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 and 3. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. That he might, this is, by the way, this was after their 40 years and they were on the precipice of going in. And Moses is preaching to them and he's recounting all the steps that brought him to the place that they're at right now. And he says, God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. If you're one of those that believes that God would never let his children suffer anything or go through uncomfortable situations or be sick for a season, for a reason, for a purpose, or to suffer any kind of um, suffering, then you are setting yourself up to be blindsided when the suffering comes. And so I think it's good for us to look at the suffering of others that God allowed to happen to some of the greatest saints that ever lived, and they weren't being punished. They were being refined as gold in the fire. John 16.33 says, In the world you will have tribulation. That's a promise. That's a promise from Jesus. And he says in Acts 14.22, this is Paul. He says, Through many tribulations you must enter the kingdom of God. And then in Matthew 13, we have the parable of the sower. There's four types of soils. Um, that Jesus has given us examples here of how to live our lives and how to prepare our hearts. Because these soils were human hearts. One's a hard heart, one's a rocky soil heart, one is thorny soil, which is the cares of the world and so on. And then you have one that's actually good, that's actually going to grow a tree that's going to flourish and produce fruit, and that's the good soil. But I'm only going to focus on one of them, which is the rocky soil. Imagine the, the ground, the hard soil is it, the seed lands on the path and it can't go in there. The birds come and snatch it up. That's what he says. It's like Satan. It's the, it gets set, seed is scattered on all indiscriminately and it lands on the heart, the human heart. And that, that, does it go in or is it too hard? If it goes in, and then there's still some more things that need to be done for it to actually produce. Because here on the rocky soil, it says other seeds fell on the rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Uh, We can hear the word. It can land on our heart. We can have some soil there that receives it, and it goes up for, a, for a, a bit. In fact, it's joyful. Wow, look what Jesus did for me. He's going to make me prosperous. He's going to do all these things for me, and it's actually for me, 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 rather than one who has been broken in their sin and realizes I need a Savior to save me from myself and comes to Christ in not asking him for a thing. And then, yes, the benefits of the Lord come flowing to us, we can find all kinds of promises that he's going to do that. But that's not the purpose that we come to him. We come to him to be saved of our sin. So the disciples came back and asked for interpretation of of this because they couldn't quite understand it. So then I'm going to skip down to verse 20 and 21. And he says, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Do you think the children of Israel, when they were, they've been in bondage for 400 years. They, um, they've been hard taskmasters. 
they've heard about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they probably had scrolls that, that had the genealogies in the book of Genesis in it. Maybe they had a lot more that we don't even have today that, that perished with, you know, with time. But they had faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac. I hear all these promises, but here we are. We're in bondage. And the heart, I think, kind of grows hard during that period. But I think they could have been on rocky soil. Because every time things were good, they were rejoicing, they were dancing, the God saved us from this and that and the other thing. But as soon as they went through hardship, as soon as they were thirsty for a couple of days, now hey, I'm not saying that would be easy. I don't even know how I would respond in those situations, so I'm, I'm not going to lay down a hammer on them because it could come right back on my own head and our heads. But let's learn from it and say, I don't want to be that way. I don't want to just rejoice and dance when things are good. I want to rejoice and dance when things aren't so good. And then he says, um, they receive it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution or the Egyptians running after them or this no water, we've been two days without water, three days without water, and I got babies, and they start grumbling and complaining, and you think, well, that just seems natural. Why would God get so upset with that? But he does. He does because it's a, it's, it's a lack of faith at that point. And he only does it for a season. It's a testing time. It isn't how he wants us to see us suffering through those things. But he does like to test us. That is our God. He says, but he endures for a while when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word. Immediately they fall away. I say that's temporary faith. It's not real faith. Real faith endures to the end. The man who um, uh, receives the word and endures to the end, that man will be saved according to Matthew chapter 24. Not the one who has faith for a season, and then when things aren't as good, they forsake Christ and they leave him. I think that was temporary faith. That was faith that wasn't rooted in Christ. It wasn't rooted in being a, a, a child of God. Um, this is why we need to understand the doctrine of suffering. I want to under, understand it now. And Rob did a fantastic job last week. I listened to the, the message Thursday in da- when I was in Dallas right before we came home. And I, and I really thought that was one of the best messages I'd heard on suffering. And, um, and I could feel the passion in his heart. Did you, guys, was you, did you guys enjoy that? It was a wonderful message. And I'm not saying that to puff up our pastor because I really, I just said that over and over to Michelle what a blessing that was to hear that because we need to hear that and and that um in any way it was a great message and very needed um and there was some overlap too by the way i kept hearing him quoting scriptures because what is the wilderness it's suffering because so there's suffering involved in a wilderness period you're going to suffer when you're in the wilderness that's just that's just the definition. We can go back and read those definitions again, but that definition is going to cause suffering. Whether it's physical and whether you're going through times of lack or whether you're going through mental anguish and pain in your mind, that's what I, the experiences I had, my wilderness experiences involve that. And I'll tell you, mental anguish and mental suffering and despair and hopelessness can definitely I would say usually be worse than physical suffering because you can't really heal it except through faith. (laughs) It was when I believed, as when I came out of that wilderness period that I was in, it was was when I believed. Um, Back in 2015, 16, 17, during that era, I had a house in Arvada. We called the Taft House. Uh, Micah and Shrey lived there for a while. I think Jesse and Erica were there for maybe a year um, of that. Kayla was there. Um, and Jaska, our friend, who lives in Texas now, um, was there. And we just had such good times in the Lord there. But one of the things, we used to watch these films from Open Doors that was, um, there were videos on there of martyrs and people who had gone through persecution, the, the persecuted church. I went on there to look at it last night, and they're not on there anymore. I'm not really sure why. But there was all these different videos, and there was one of them that I wanted to mention. Is Her name was Helen. She was from a country called 
Eritrea or something like that. I've never heard of it, but it's in, I think it's in Africa. And she tells the story about how she loved worshiping God, and she loved sharing the gospel. She was always on the streets. Well, she got put in jail for it. And um, not just a jail, a shipping container, the, a small one where she could hardly move. And she was in it not for a week, but for two years. She was in this little shipping container. And listening to her testimony will blow your mind when she tells you, you know what? I thank God for that shipping container, and I did it every day while I was in there because I fell in love with my Savior all the more when I was in there. I had nothing else to depend upon but Christ. And you don't think that the Lord didn't look down on her when she was in a shipping container with compassion and love and mercy. I don't want her to go through that, yet I want her to go through it because I know what it's going to bring her to at the end. And that's what you have to look at. When you're in a shipping container or you're in some sort of suffering like that that seems off the charts, that's off the charts to me, that God would allow that to happen into one of the a great saint of God. But we read about him in the Bible. We read, we read him through history. She's not alone. There's lots of people who have suffered for the gospel or suffered, and yet God was never left their side. That's the doctrine of suffering we need to know. It isn't something that's permanent, although I've heard of others. Rich Wormbrandt was in prison for 13 years and suffered and was beaten and all that kind of stuff. Um, and yet when she comes out and says she wouldn't trade that position, that just that convicts me, that blows my mind. But another one that did that too was, I thought of this one last night and added it in um, to my message here, as a man named Michael. When I was going to my, my brother has a church in Westminster called Novation. When I was going there in 2011, 12, 13, in that era, um, um, there was, hold on. There was a guy there, and he was in a, a wheelchair, but it was kind of like a wheel bed or something like that. Like he had to lean back, and, and he had some sort of disease. And I, I thought it was it came on during life, but I, my brother was telling me that it, that he was born that way. And he was married, and so, um, but he um, he was laying there in his thing. And when I went up to talk to him, um, he just amazed me. And he would just talk about Jesus with this glimmer in his eye, and he's kind of all twisted up on the bed. And I just love Jesus. He just, you know, and he the way he was talking to me, and the situation that he was in really was unbelievable. And I remember um, I just listened to him for a while, and I just leaned over to him and said, Michael, I am so sorry that you're going through what you're going through. I'm so sorry you're going through that. And he just looked up to me and said, Mike, please don't be sorry. I'm so thankful for this. I, I thank God every day. And this may go counter to some some of your thinking here about what God does with suffering at times. But when he said that to me, he, said, he told me, he said, I fell in love with Jesus early on in my life because I had nothing else to turn to. And he said, it got worse. He said, at the beginning, it wasn't so bad, but then it got really bad, and, I, and that's the, the suffering got worse here. But the worse it got, the more I depended upon the Lord. And so they only gave me, they thought I was going to be dead at 12 years old, but he ends up, he's still alive, according to my brother, and he's like 50 now, um, and he's lived, lived like that. And his, his, he had a wife that married him like that, and um, she's normal, and, um, and she serves him. I mean, she felt a calling to marry him and serve him and take care of him and all that kind of stuff, but the, he's just a, such a humble man, just so full of the spirit of Jesus It was beyond anything that I could ever be. I want to be like him. Um, okay, I'm going to do a quick flyover now of some verses in that I went through in Exodus and um, in Numbers. I was going to read them all, and then I realized oh, I'm never going to get to the type and shadows if I do that. So I'm just going to do a short flyover of, of um, some of the Experience, wilderness experience. I wanted to lay out the wilderness first to you guys to understand what are these guys, what did they go through? 
and then apply it to our lives. Apply it to your life. Um, so in Exodus 14, we see the first, the first one. And Exodus 14 is right after 12 and 13, which is the great just deliverance from Egypt, the Passover. And then they leave out victorious in chapter 13, and they plummet, pillage the, the Egyptians, as the promise of God told them to do, of all their gold and silver and everything else. And they're, what do you think that the journey from there to the Red Sea was like? I don't know how many miles that is. Maybe it took them a couple days, maybe a week, I don't know. But I bet you there was a lot of singing, rejoicing, smiles, and happiness because God just delivered them, which we should be. That's when God delivers us and gives us that thing that's, that's, that's the, the obvious right thing to do. It's the right response. Um, but now they're backed up against, they come to the Red Sea, and this is their test. I call this the, the Red Sea test because now they're there. What are we going to do? Well, we're going to have to go around the Red Sea, but all of a sudden they hear the, f- the footsteps of the horses and they see in the distance the dust and everything else, and they realize, here they come. They changed their mind. Pharaoh changed his mind, and he's coming after us. And we are backed up against the Red Sea, and guess what they start doing? God did this to us. Moses did this to us. There wasn't enough graves in Egypt, so he brought us here to die. They couldn't stop and say, wow, look at the salvation that that God brought us out of Egypt. He loves us so much. But instead, the first impulse was to go to unbelief and to mistrust God. And, but God hears it, and he brings down the pillar of fire in front of them, and it, and it blocks them. It's a shield. It's his protection. Um, I was hearing Micah and Rob and some of the others before service talking about a lot of the different um, types and shadows in the wilderness, um, and um, I'm going to be, I've got a half a dozen or so that I'm going to talk to in a little bit, and they mentioned that one, I thought, man, they're going to be disappointed when I'm, they're hearing my message, and it's going to be all about <laughs> the wilderness experience, and then, and then finding Christ in it will be definitely part of it, but I really wanted to build this part up, because I think that that's, that's something that all of us can apply to, is this, but um, but here it is, is, we know the story. We've seen the Ten Commandments. Moses you know, brings his rod down and, and the waters come up. I don't know how deep it was. Let's call it 100 feet, some, some massive depth. And they all come through the Red Sea on dry ground, which is a type that we're going to see. Some of these are types that I'm going to bring up here when I get to the New Testament because in... in um, uh, 1 Corinthians, they bring that, that part up. That's a type of baptism. And that uh, Paul brings that up. And, um, and so they come through on dry ground, and they're running. They're see, still seeing. And all of a sudden, God takes down the, the pillar of fire, and he goes over with the Israelites and the Egyptians. Now, wh- isn't this dumb? You've seen all these miracles and all these things happening against you and pillaged your land because of the God of Israel. You've seen it happen. And now you've seen this pillar of fire guarding us from going after them. He's protecting them. And he sees them go through protected. And now all of a sudden, the, the, the pillar of fire comes down. If I'm one of those guys, I think I'm going to stay on the shore. I'm gonna, I'll take my chances with Pharaoh at the other, on the other side of it rather than the God of the Israelites who was there to destroy the enemies of God and the enemies of his people that he cherishes. Instead, um, they go through and they go in there. Their wheels get stuck in the, in the mud and so forth. And then the water comes crashing down on them. Israel sees this. They're on the other side of the shoreline. They see it happen. Can you imagine being on that shoreline and all of a sudden you see it. Oh, here they come. They're coming just like us. Oh, and then all of a sudden the waters come down on them just like these crashing waves. Destruction of their enemies destroyed. And then it says, it says then in uh, Exodus 14, 30 and 31, 
Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. I hate to say it, but it's temporary faith again, because this didn't last long. You see that, you would think, that's it. I'm set for life. I got my faith. I'm grounded now. I'm never going to budge from that. But it's just not so. Um, as we move into Exodus 15, well, 15, the first part is the Song of Moses, the victory song, uh, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. You know, we sing that song. And that's, that was written, that comes from that, that chapter. And, um, and they, they, um, they're rejoicing, dancing, and in, 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 in full of joy. And then right away, they come into the waters of Mara, Mara, Mara the, sorry, the waters at Mara, and they thirsted there. They came to the waters of Mara, and they're bitter, and they couldn't drink, and they were thirsty, and they began to grumble. Where is the God of Israel? Where is the God of Abraham? They just immediately he saw this literally a couple days earlier and then began to question. And then in Exodus 16, it says they suffered hunger in the next chapter. And it's, they begin to say things like, I remember, we remember the meat pots and the bread in Egypt. And they grumbled against Moses. They remembered the meat pots and the bread in Egypt. Do they remember the stripes on their backs? Do they remember the 14 hours of labor? Do they remember um, all, the th all the things that they had to go through there? They didn't. They only remembered, they tried to come up with some reason why God was against them. But it, God says, and continually, at the end of each one of these, that it was a test. And then one more time, they test him when they thirsted at Rephidim. And here's their answer. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children with thirst? And then lastly, in Numbers 13 and 14, um, the Lord told Moses to send out spies in the land of Canaan. This is their last and final really big test. They're sending out spies into the land of Canaan. Why do you think that would be a test of them? Anyone want to jump at that one, Micah? Why would that be a test? What's that? To see the challenge. They're going to go in there and they're going to see the reality of the land of Canaan as these spies come back. There's 12 of them, one from each tribe, and 10 of them come back, and you know the story, with an evil report. It's too big. It's too mighty. We can't do it. They're, we're grasshoppers in their eyes and so on. They can't, they can't do it. And this is the last straw for, for many of them, for most of them. Um, all the others he lived with, but that was the last straw. And so he brings a judgment. The two faithful ones, though, were Caleb and Joshua. We could be remiss by not mentioning that you can be faithful when there is. They had faith. That was the only difference. They saw the same giants. They saw the same formidable land that was ahead of them. But the difference was they saw through eyes of faith. They saw a God that was greater. They saw a God who just destroyed the Egyptian army in front of them. Why wouldn't they be able to destroy the Canaanites? But they just couldn't hold on to their faith. And I have the whole thing to read, but I'm not going to. Um, the last verse, though, of that whole section and the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? And I thought, that's a very strong language. That he, he saw it as, he's felt despised when they didn't believe that he was going to bring. He already promised. And they're, they're saying, no, he's not going to do it. He felt despised. And that's what, that's what um, he described it as. All right, I'm going to transition now into the New Testament typology. And I've got about 20 minutes, I think. Um, so the first one is pretty obvious to me, but Israel going into the wilderness was a type and shadow of Christ going into the wilderness to be tested. The types that I chose here in, as I was studying through, I went the last month or two, I just was going through Exodus to Deuteronomy and just studying, writing down things and just really spending a lot of time so I could... But I really wanted just to focus on a handful that the New Testament 
absolutely clearly already interprets as, um, as types of Christ. So in this case, we see in Matthew 4, verses 1 and 2, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And we know the rest of the story. The, the devil finds an opportune time against Jesus there in his weakness. And he comes on like a flood and he begins to tempt him to do things that he knew God wouldn't want him to do. And so, but Jesus passed that test. But that's when the devil's going to come to us is when we're in our weakness. But um, how did Jesus get into the wilderness there? Anybody? The Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I don't know if that goes against your theology, but it's right there in Scripture. That's, this God will allow that for a season. Rob so eloquently brought up that God never tempts with evil. James says that, you know. The devil is the tempter. Our flesh is the thing that yields to that temptation. But God is the tester. He, brought, he brings it there for purposes that are for our good. All things are good for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. But in Mark 1, look at this, how Mark describes it. The Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. Now, I don't see Jesus ever resisting the will of God. You know, it almost, it's a different verbiage, right? Like a different um, use, a different verb to use than lead. I see a picture of lead, you know, grabbing Malachi and just kind of taking him somewhere. Driving is like pushing, but I don't believe, I just think he was being more dramatic with it to, uh, for some reason. I don't know how, why he worded it that way. I just know Jesus submitted to the will of his Father at all times without question. Not that he wasn't grieving. We see that in the Garden of Gethsemane, that it was difficult. He went through difficult times. He cried and sweat, sweated blood, but he, he, he never um, went against the will of the Father. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians 10. There was quite a few types here. 1 Corinthians 10, um, chapters or verses 1 through 4, he says, and I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to come back and look at the types. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea, that was the parting of the Red Sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. This is what I was telling you about. And all the same, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed him, and that rock was Christ. So verses 1 and 2, going through the Red Sea was a type of baptism. Do you guys see it there? Do you see that? I mean, it's, it's not easy to see. That's probably the more obscure one, but this is Paul. When I read, he sees types in the Old Testament. He was anointed. This came to Scripture. This isn't man's interpretation. This is the Holy Spirit. This isn't me telling you. Um, that this is a type, this is Paul, the scriptures telling us, but it was a type of baptism. And then next we see manna, the spiritual food. He says, and all ate that spiritual food. And I didn't mention this, when it, in chapter 16 when they hungered is when God brought the, ma the manna to them. It came down, how did it come down? It just came down from heaven is how it's described. It came down from heaven, and it, it was a miracle. There's never been such a, a thing happened, and it, and it never will be, um, and there never was before it. But the manna was brought down by God as a spiritual food, as a miracle food, and it fed the children of Israel for 40 years. And if you, and, and it says that they ate from that spiritual food. I interpret that as manna, but I'm going to tell you how Jesus interprets that as himself. In John 6, starting in verse 30. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe in you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They were quarreling with Jesus. They wanted, they wanted more food. They'd already, he had already turned the loaves, or the, the five loaves into, you know, and the fish to feed the 5,000, they want, they came to more food. You know, Moses did it, why can't you do it? They, he did it daily, why can't you do it? 
And so then Jesus is going to interpret now what that food was that did come from heaven to Moses and to the children of Israel. 32, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of heaven, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. But Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. And then he strengthens the metaphor here of the manna as we go down to verse 48. He says, I am the bread of life. I'm the manna of life. (laughs) Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. You just see Jesus, he putting himself in that same, just as the manna came down, that was a type of me coming down to the earth and, and my, and to give bread, I am the bread of life. I am the manna that they saw in the wilderness. He says, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And he goes on to give a more metaphor of, lest we eat his flesh and blood, there's no life in us. But again, it's a metaphor or a type and a shadow of the, of the, the manna. Actually, the manna, I'm sorry, was the, was the type and the shadow of the Christ. And then um, the next one is the water of life, the spiritual drink. He says in verse 3 again, and they, I'm sorry, verse 4, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. That was the, one of those chapters that I flied over, which was, I think it was in 17 or 20. Um, This time, there wasn't, actually the one was the bitter, the bitter one that I talked about, but then there's one later on in chapter 20 where it happens again. They're hungry, or they're thirsty, and they grumble, they complain. God tells Moses to speak to the rock. Well, he takes the rod, and he's angry, and he hits it twice, and he, he's going to suffer for that one too. It's the only time we see any reference to Moses and disobedience, but God told him to speak to it, and he smacked it twice hard in anger, and most commentators believe that that was what cost him, that, that what was God was upset with was he was actually angry with the Lord because he had given him this people, and here I am again having to listen to them, and, it's, and then God rebukes him and says, because of that, you're not going into the promised land. Um, I'm going to bury you here, because he's 120 years old at that point, too. They buried him on Mount Nebo, and he buried him on Mount Nebo because of that. Um, So the water of life that flowed from the rock was a type of Christ. That rock that came out of there, because God still fulfilled it, even if he smacked it, water came gushing out, and all the children of Israel were able to drink. This, Paul says, is the spiritual water. It's a spiritual drink that came out of there. It was Christ flowing out of that water. He says he's the living water. It says in John 4, in verse 10, Speaking to the woman at the well, he says, Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So he is the living water. And then three three more verses down in verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So that is Christ. He's speaking of himself when he speaks of being that spiritual water and that Paul sees the metaphor of the water gushing from the rock as Christ gushing from that rock. But then he goes further and he says that rock was Christ. So not only was he the water flowing from it, but he was the rock that it flowed from. I remember one long time ago when I read that and I thought I was reading that rock was Christ. Like where... Obviously, I believe that that's what it is because it's in the Bible and Paul's writing it. But I was like, how did he come up with that? That the, a rock in the wilderness was Christ. And um, I, I didn't know much about types and shadows and things like that at that time. But I read that and I thought, I believe it. Um, but it just kind of blew my mind that, that it, like, you, know, you start seeing all these things that are referred to as Christ. 
And then I look at it and say, Paul went into the desert of Arabia for three years after he got, he didn't, it says he didn't confer with flesh and blood. He went to the scriptures and to the Holy Spirit alone with God in the wilderness to study them. And I believe these revelations came to him. Think now back to when I was talking about the road to Emmaus and Jesus says, beginning at Moses, he began to expound to him all these things that pointed to himself. I think this was one of them. I think all of these are, are points that he's bringing out to him. Do you realize that water, that rock was Christ? Do you realize the water flowing from it was the Christ? Do you realize? And then he just would continue all these verses and all these places. And there's probably so many that I, I wouldn't even think of it unless I just went to the, the ones that obviously had the New Testament interpretation that these were types. That, those are the easy ones. But there are so many more that we, could, that we could come up with. Maybe you guys could come up with. And then the lastly was the rock that Moses struck. In verse 4, the rock was Christ. Can't be any more clear than, than that. He basically interprets it right there. That rock was Christ. Was it physically Christ? Or was it a type of Christ? Either way, he says it was Christ. I'm just going to go with the interpretation of Paul. And then now we're going to move into one more section here. Right after that, we're one through four of it. Now he's going to talk in verse five. And now Paul's going to give the Corinthians, which is us too, by the way, when, you, when we read this, a huge warning. Now we've seen all this, and we see the good things that God did in the Christ in the Old Testament, but it says here in verse 5, Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And when I think about that, how were they overthrown in the wilderness? We don't see armies there. There wasn't, I mean, we don't hear of any animals that attacked them or anything else like that. What were they over, how were they overthrown? What? Unbelief is the, is the overthrow of the children of Israel. Unbelief. So that's what he's warning his readers here. So I know this message, sometimes when I come um, this way, I'm, I'm going to speak what I see from the Word of God. And, that, and I love to exalt Christ in, in, in the messages. And I also want to bring forth um, for us an admonition from the Scriptures to live the way God wants us to live. And this is, this is what he says. Now these things took place as an example for us, that we might not desire evil as they do. Wait a minute. I thought we weren't supposed to have the Old Testament as this, it's not for us. The New Testament is all we need to read, and it's Jesus and, you know, in the Old Testament, God of anger and wrath. We don't need that anymore. It's all been done at the cross. It's partially true. But he's saying here that the examples that these were overthrown in the wilderness through unbelief is for you and me. So I'm going to read them uh, when I see them in Scripture and apply it to myself. Um, and he says, and do not be idolaters, as some of them were. When were they idolaters in the Old Testament? Anyone think? How were they an idolater? What's that? The calf. Because the, that's what he refers to here in this. And this is in Exodus 32. It says, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That was a direct quote right after they were dancing around that calf. What happened? They'd seen all these things. Moses goes up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, and um, he's up there 40 days. Well, they get anxious and impatient, and where's the God of Israel? It wasn't Moses brought us out of here. This calf brought us out of here. And they, and they quickly turned uh, on them, and he's saying, don't be like them. And then he says, we must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. This is a reference in Numbers chapter 25 when, remember Balaam and his curse, he was trying to curse and he couldn't do it. Well, guess what he does? He goes to Balak and says, here's what you got to do. Get them wrong with their God. Get them to sin against their God and then you've got them. You're not going to get him to curse them and I can't curse them. 
but you can get him in trouble with him, and their, his wrath will come on. So he tempts them, and they, they sent the Moabite women out to the, to the men of Israel and tempted them in lust and sexual immorality. And you know what stopped the wrath? Because there was 23,000 people of Israel died because of sexual immorality. What's that? There was um, a man named Phineas, who's the grandson of Aaron, the son of um, Eliezer. And he hears of one of these incidences, and it gives a long description of this. A man named Zimri was one of the people, I think he was from the tribe of Simeon, if I'm not mistaken, but he brings in a woman from the Moabite. Guess where he brought her? Into his tent in front of his children and his wife. And he has, sorry if there's children in here, but I'm just going to tell you what the Bible says. They had sex in front of their family. And this was an abomination. This was abhorred by God. And guess what happens? When it abhors God, it should abhor you and I. And it abhorred Phineas, son of Eliezer. And he went and got a spear. And it says he took that spear and he came up and he opened the tent door and he jammed it right in the back of Zimri and threw him into the belly of the woman and stuck it in the ground and killed them both. That's pretty intense, isn't it? It'd be a rated R movie for sure. So I'm sorry about your kids in here me saying that, but it's the truth. And you think, well, maybe, maybe he was a little overzealous. Maybe he shouldn't have done that. No. You know what it says? That God said, I'm going to reward the zeal of Phineas. There will never be a man out of his house that's not in the priesthood. For generation after generation after generation. Because of his honor of me. You know, it says in 1 Samuel 2.30, when Eli is being rebuked, because he didn't stop the women at the... Um, at the gate of the temple and he were having sex with them and it's it, and he didn't stop them and so he got rebuked and said I will honor those who honor me I love that verse I want to honor the Lord Phineas honored the Lord now I'm not saying when you see somebody do that go grab a spear and honor the Lord and stab him in the back obviously that's not what he wants us to do but I see that as a type and a metaphor of going after your sin, going after and helping others out of theirs. Now, obviously, I'm not meaning go after them in that same spirit, but let's look at sin in our lives and in the lives of others, the lives of this church, and let's go after it like the zeal of Phineas and put a spear in its back. You want to honor the Lord? He is honored when we honor his holiness. It's not just when we dance and praise. and all that. That's all part of it. Let's do that. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Let's do all those things. But if it's not given that same zeal of Phineas to hate sin the way he hates it, if, we're, if anyone's in sexual immorality in here, let's help them out. Let's gently do it for a, for a while. Then let's do it stronger. But if it's in your own life, go after it with, like Phineas went after that sin. I'm running out of time, and I have a lot more, so I'm just going to briefly say a couple last things. Um, Hebrews 3 I don't even know if I gave those scriptures to I'm not going to read it or anything I'm trying to relieve Rob here because he sees that I've got a long ways to go um, the whole book of Hebrews is a book of types and shadows one several, like, several days I just spent and poured out into Hebrews um, when I was in Dallas writing down, and I was just writing down types and shadows in the book of Hebrews. They're so loaded in there. And it interprets itself as they are shadows of things to come over and over. You want to get where you get that terminology, it comes from there. That's the strongest book. But in Hebrews 3, there's the rest, the rest, um, like a, I'm resting, the rest in the land of Canaan that God promised through Moses as a type and shadow of the spiritual rest that we have in Christ. He interprets it that way here, and then he gives them a warning. Like right when he gives a, um, he tells them to not harden their hearts like they did in the rebellion. What's the rebellion? It was their unbelief, 
he says to not be that way. And I'm not going to go on and read this whole thing. There's so much in this that I could have uh, done. But um, the last one I'm going to do is the bronze serpent. That's another one that's in, interpreted by Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, the, the bronze serpent was a type of Christ dying on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. It's from Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. I would love to read the whole thing, but um, there, there we see that the, uh, they grumbled. And you think, well, he's probably upset with that, but you know, it's, it's much stronger than that. He said he sent serpents to them, and they bit, and thousands died. 23,000, I think, is, I'm not sure that, that one, the, the total number, but there was a bunch of people that were killed with the serpents. Well, you know what the remedy was on that? Moses got a, a pole, and then he put a bronze serpent around it, and anyone who came up and looked at that pole would be healed of, their, of the serpent's biting, and, and that's how they were healed. And that is a clear interpretation as a type and shadow of Christ on the cross because he says it um, in John 3, verse 14 and 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So he says it right there. I am, I am the fulfillment of that. That was a type of me on that bronze pole um, when I'm on the cross. Anyone who looks at me will be healed, have eternal life. That's the, that's the, so that was a type. The Old Testament was the bronze serpent. By the way, in, in, um, in 2 Kings 18.4, it's interesting that a thousand years later, was, is that a thousand for Hezek, to, up to Hezekiah's time? There was a lot of, lots of hundreds of years. They had to, Hezekiah had, he was destroying all the idols and in Israel as a revival, Asherah poles and all that kind of stuff, and one of them he had to kill, to destroy into pieces, it says, was the bronze serpent because the people had turned it into an idol. They saw that. Instead of what it, the shadow, they saw that as the real, they saw that as the substance, and they worshipped it. But instead, it was, a, it was a shadow. It was a type of the Christ who was going to die on the cross. So now I'm going to just bring us down to a conclusion here, application. I wrote down here, most if not all the saints of old were tested through suffering and wilderness experiences. Job, Jeremiah, Paul, the disciples, and Jesus himself. Why would we be surprised, why would we be surprised if we have to go through the wilderness too or go through any kind of suffering? Whether it be, I mean, I don't want to minimize suffering, guys. Lose a loved one or you have disease or you have... Um, loss of a job that was, that's now put you in severe hardship, mental torture that I've attested to, um, all those things. I don't want to minimize those things, but sometimes they're, brought, they're allowed to come to us, not God tempting us or God bringing it, but allowing Satan to buffet us for a season so that when we come out of it, our faith is going to be like gold. When you go through the wilderness of suffering, one of two things is going to happen. One, you will grow in Christ. You will lean on him and trust him more than ever. You will come to know him in ways that you could have never imagined possible. Or, number two, you'll become embittered, hating life, embittered with people, and worst of all, embittered with God. So that's the two choices. When we go through the wilderness, those, one of those two things is going to happen. The wilderness is a heat when that heat's turned up, what's going to come out? So, sometimes it doesn't come out so pretty. We find out where our unbelief is. I found out where mine was, and I hated it. And yet, at the same time, it was coming up. It was coming up to the surface. He's skimming that off, throwing off that dross. And when it came through it, when I came through the last time, I thought I was just came through the desert and found that pool of water, and I drank and I couldn't get enough and I've never looked back at the faithfulness of God and the I'm not saying I've never been tempted and, and struggled here and there with different days of, of downness or depression but my overall effect has been I believe in the faithfulness of my father and he will see me through in the shepherd who he uses through Jesus Christ
Let's trust the Lord when things are going against us. Let's keep our eyes on eternity and the throne of Christ that is soon coming.